begin with our second installment of Oil Sands at a Crossroads. This week, we're focusing on the politically and economically controversial development of Canada's oil sands. In the quest to find a better price for oil, Canadian companies have proposed a series of pipelines to heavy oil refineries and a few select markets. Some pipelines, such as the Keystone XL, are headed to the Gulf Coast of the United States. Others headed to refineries east in Quebec. But there's a big proposal to build a pipeline to the west coast of Canada to get heavy Canadian crude to Chinese refineries. Jessica Stone takes us to that debate. There's nowhere else on earth that you have this quality of life. In the westernmost part of Canada, north of Vancouver, British Columbia, lies one of the last wild places in North America, where millions of tourists come from around the world each year to enjoy the outdoors. More than 200 Aboriginal peoples also live off the region's rich natural resources. If you can. I mean, this is as fresh as you can get them, right? Gerald Amos is the former chief counselor for the Heisla First Nation, an Aboriginal group which has lived off seafood, caught along the coast of British Columbia for generations. It's a good sight, isn't it? But just across the bay, in the port of Kitimat, some of the world's heaviest industries are expanding their presence. Rio Tinto is refurbishing an aluminum smelter Shell has a new liquid natural gas terminal, and Enbridge has proposed a pipeline that would carry half a million barrels of unrefined heavy oil each day from the oil sands in Alberta to this harbor for export. The port of Kitimat here behind me makes a lot of sense as the destination point for the Enbridge pipeline. It's a deep water port that doesn't freeze over in the winter, but even more important than that is the fact that it's closer to Shanghai, China than either of the ports in either Vancouver, British Columbia or San Francisco, California. So far, Asia has been a largely untapped market for Canadian oil producers. Right now, they sell more than 99% of their oil to the United States for less money than they could get on the global oil market. So it's critical that we get another customer so that we can get world-class prices for our most important export. John Carruthers is the president of Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline project. It's his job to convince Canadians and their government to approve the proposal. But nearly a decade after it was initially proposed, Northern Gateway is caught up in red tape and public suspicion. Chinese oil giants Sinook and Sinopec have invested one-tenth of the $6.5 billion cost of the project. They think it would take longer than they might have expected from uh, their own domestic projects that they would have undertaken, but they understand the process. You don't think that your investors are concerned about the length of time it's taking to get this project approved? I think we're all concerned about, well, one, how long will it take and what will the decision be? I think that's just, I mean, that, that is the process we're going through. Canada's federal government is expected to make a final decision by mid-2014, after 18 months of public hearings. British Columbia's government has yet to throw its support behind the project. Northern Gateway would travel more than 1,000 kilometres across three mountain ranges and 700 waterways, from Alberta to the port of Kitimat, British Columbia. While Enbridge says about two-thirds of the Aboriginal peoples that live along the pipeline's proposed path have accepted an equity offer in the project, dozens of other so-called First Nations in British Columbia have banded together against it. On the 22,000 square kilometers where the Wet'suwet'en people live, the message is clear. No is no, and no means no. John Ridsdale, also called Chief Namox, has officially banned all pipelines from Wet'suwet'en territory. He's taken his message to boardrooms, the National Review Panel, and even Enbridge investors. And the Wet'suwet'en have told him, your money will sit there and it will rot because the project will not happen. Alex Pietrella leads the Regional Industrial Development Society. 
He says Kitimat needs to welcome industry to improve the area's roads, education and health care. If we don't develop our resources and if we don't develop our economy, um, we'll one day stand there without the royalties and revenues that we need to, to feed the demands of society. Don't you want jobs? Don't you want health care and, and amenities like the rest of the country? Yes, uh, we're not anti-industry, but we will control what will happen on our territory and at what pace. Somebody has to say no at, at some point. You know, the Kalamazoo, a perfect example. Nobody said enough with a no, and look what happened there. In July 2010, an Enbridge pipeline burst, dumping hundreds of thousands of gallons of bitumen into the Kalamazoo River in the U.S. state of Michigan. It took 17 hours before it was discovered. While more than a million and a half gallons of oil have now been recovered, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates there are still nearly 200,000 gallons remaining. It has ordered Enbridge to dredge the riverbed. I, I would think we would have uh, recovered well over 90 percent of that oil and I, I I haven't read that latest. The current that they're still trying to get out of the bo bottom of the river is uh, close to 200,000. Well it would not be a, again in looking at the barrels you'd get the vast but you can get the vast majority of that oil out. What would you say Enbridge has learned from that that's informed its ability to make this pipeline safer? Yes, yeah, so, so again, it, it was a, a very humbling experience for Enbridge, uh, very tragic in terms of an incident that affected a waterway. So you, you look at that and say, how do we avoid that going forward? Enbridge says Northern Gateway will be able to detect a spill immediately and shut it down within 10 minutes. It'll have 10 round-the-clock staffed pump stations for a quicker response. We can't guarantee that there won't be a spill, but that's why you go to such great assurances and, and learnings from what was happening. That's where the, the, Enbridge, um, the Enbridge terminal would be. Gerald Amos worries more about the potential for an oil spill as tankers approach the port. The disaster in the making. Just the sheer, just the amount of rocks. I mean, it's, it's riddled with reefs and, you know, and the, the windstorms that are, that are out there are unparalleled, you know, in terms of wave size and just the, the sheer force of the wind. In response, Enbridge has mandated a tanker certification program, two pilots per tanker as guides, and two tugs to escort every loaded tanker. Despite adding millions of dollars in safeguards, though, Enbridge could still have to find its mandate to build Northern Gateway in court. I, I don't think that, uh, that there are many First Nations that could, could afford it. However, I think that this there, there is so much passion around this, this issue that there are a lot of people who are prepared to, to fundraise. Are you going to stick it out? You've seen that we're very committed, but we're very committed for, for two basic reasons. One, it's a fundamental need for Canadians to get full value for its resources. The second is to, we, we believe it can be built and operated safe. Against this backdrop of British Columbia's rugged, unspoiled beauty, many of the region's First Nations say they'll need more convincing. Jessica Stone, CCTV, Kitimat, British Columbia.